Welcome everyone, and uh, thank you for coming to this event. When we talk about uh, social change happening, we sometimes see that the court leads, we sometimes see uh, the politicians lead, we sometimes see that one or the other hinders the process. And in the story you're going to hear today, you're going to see at least all four of those uh, things occur, some of them in the last hour. Um, so uh, uh, welcome to everyone. Thank you for coming to this event, Reflections on Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Uh, it is co-sponsored by uh, Qualsa, the Women's Law Society, the American Constitution Society, and Law Career Services. So thank you to all of those groups. Um, I recommend them to you all heartily. Um, thankfully, our speaker has asked me to keep his introduction short because he is the kind of person it would be easy to speak about for quite some time because of his many impressive accomplishments. Uh, it is an honor to introduce uh, Dan Woods as a speaker today. He's a partner at the Los in the Los Angeles office of the prestigious global law firm White & Case very experienced trial lawyer with a focus on complex business litigation who frequently works for non-US clients. Um, his extensive experience in those areas would be enough to recommend him to you all, um, but he is actually here, and this is probably a lesson we can all take, uh, you can all take as law students and to remember as younger lawyers. Uh, he's actually here to talk to us today about a pro bono matter that he took up uh, about seven uh, years ago, representing the log cabin Republicans in their challenge against the U.S. military's don't ask, don't tell policy. As a result uh, of that, um, in the last year, Dan's been recognized by the Daily Journal as one of the top 100 lawyers in California, um, by the ABA receiving their Public Service and Professionalism Award, uh, and he's been uh, uh, named by the California Lawyer and the Recorder as an Attorney of the Year. As you hear his story, and think about both the important implications of the case that he led, you should also think about the implications um, this, uh, this kind of type of matter has had for him as a lawyer and in his career. Um, I want to uh, recommend that you listen carefully to all that he has to say. I think that and many other things we will learn from him today. So it's my a great honor to introduce Dan Woods to you all. Thank you for coming today. Thank uh, well, well, thank you all again for coming. Um, and I'm very, very happy to be here to talk to you about the Don't Ask, Don't Tell case that we tried and won uh, last summer. Uh, the case, first of all, provided me with a wonderful opportunity to use whatever skills and talents I have as a trial lawyer. As somebody who tries a lot of cases and a lot of big, high-profile cases, every trial is different, but every trial has its own memorable moments. This particular trial had a great number of memorable moments, and they range from things like winning important constitutional law arguments, to arguing about the admissibility of a tweet from the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, and to being able to say in a closing argument that, Your Honor, the evidence has shown that our government would rather give a convicted felon a gun than to give a gay guy a typewriter. Um, but the case had much more significance than just what we did as trial lawyers, because in this case, we were you know, concerned about, of course, the subject matter. The, the gay men and women on whose behalf we were fighting this case uh, did not seek to change the military. They only wanted to belong to it. They wanted to conform to military standards and values. They wanted to shave their heads. They wanted to go to boot camp. And they wanted to fight and die, if necessary, for the constitutional rights of all of us while our government was denying them theirs. And so that was the undertaking that we had in this case. And what I want to do now is show you a short video about the case. It's about 10 or 12 minutes long. And it will show you some of the witnesses that we used at the trial who were former service members. Uh, and we'll tell you a little bit about the people at our firm who worked on the case. Um, and please feel free to think about questions as you're watching the video. Uh, and when the video is done, I'll tell you a little bit more about the people you see in the video and about the current status of the case, including its uh, recent developments this morning. So without further ado, let me start with the video.
breaking news tonight from Riverside, California, where a federal judge, a U.S. District Court judge, has just declared the military's don't ask, don't tell policy to be unconstitutional. A landmark decision out of California for the first time since the Clinton administration implemented it, don't ask, don't tell, is declared unconstitutional by a federal court. There's yet another breaking story to tell you about a federal district court judge in Southern California ruling that the military's don't ask, don't tell policy is unconstitutional under the Fifth and First Amendments. I served in the Air Force as an officer for 13 years. I attained the rank of major. I worked in the communications career field. Um, in my last job, I was in an air control squadron which is similar to what the FAA does at uh, civilian airports here in the States. I joined the Navy in 1995 when I went to the Naval Academy. Um, I was there for four years. Uh, and I graduated with a degree in physics. Um, after that, I went uh, into the regular Navy. I was stationed on a ship uh, here in San Diego, the USS Shiloh. My commander called me into his office one afternoon. Uh, the first thing he did was read, uh, read to me the DOD policy on homosexuality. And then he hands me the stack of emails and asked me to explain them. And I was obviously dumbfounded because, number one, I was wondering how the heck they got a hold of him in the first place. And um, just had always been under the presumption that if I had kept my private life far removed from my professional life, I would never get caught up in Don't Ask, Don't Tell. Well, I wrote a letter to my commanding officer in July of 2000 and telling him that I was a lesbian, I came out. And also in the letter, I explained the conflict I was feeling between being forced to lie uh, every day and the Navy's core values of honor, courage, and commitment. A couple months later, my security clearance was suspended. Uh, part of my pay was terminated. Um, and this, as I said, this drug on for 16 months before I was ultimately discharged. And then on my final day of active duty, the, uh, my commander called the police to give me a police escort off the base as if I were a common criminal or a threat to national security. In total, I was in the Navy for about seven years, um, although I was supposed to be in longer but got kicked out under Don't Ask, Don't Tell. One of the associates in the Los Angeles office, a fellow named Marty Meekins, was a member of the board of directors of Log Cabin Republicans. Uh, and so he brought to me the idea of challenging Don't Ask, Don't Tell in 2004 uh, after the Supreme Court had made its decision in the Lawrence against Texas case. This is not the first time uh, the Don't Ask, Don't Tell statute has been challenged in a court of law. It's been challenged over and over again. Uh, uh, and historically it's been challenged on individual case-by-case -case, uh, nature. And uh, that was one of the, the strategies that White and Case uh, looked at as to how to go about this differently, to challenge the, the, the constitutionality of the don't ask, don't tell policy uh, and taking it from that approach. We had high confidence in them that they would be able to see this case through and that they would devote sufficient manpower and woman power to uh, make this happen, and uh, we certainly haven't been disappointed. The case was fairly quiet for a number of years, uh, but it really got going in the beginning of, the end of 2008, beginning of 2009. I think in December, we started picking out experts, um, and that's the period where I really got involved. Well, the former service members who testified were carefully selected. We wanted to have a cross-section of people talk about the impact of Don't Ask, Don't Tell on them and their units. So we had both men and women, we had both officers and enlisted personnel, and we had people from several different branches of the armed forces. How do you find ex-service members on the internet or via phone? Well, there's 13 some odd thousand of them. And believe it or not, I compiled a list of folks that seemed to be good candidates and I utilized Facebook to contact them. One of the attorneys, I believe it was Melanie, um, reached out to me um, a few months ago and she had seen one of my interviews, I think on Rachel Maddow or one of my TV appearances, and asked if I was interested in the trial. We had a meeting to see if um, I was a good fit for the case 
and ultimately they decided that I was uh, valuable to the case and I came on board. We had the most talented group of uh, consummate professionals working on this case. Each and every one of us was absolutely passionate about getting the best result for our client. We had spent years preparing this case uh, and months reviewing evidence. We had to win. There were a lot of motions beforehand. The government filed a summary judgment motion. They filed motions in limine. We had all of the usual federal court pretrial filings. We had to.